So I'm taking up a very important subject today in our uh, sermon series on parenting. It's the subject of whining. Last week I showed you that because children are conceived with a sinful nature, they are often in need of corrective discipline. Parents are the agents that God has appointed to carry out this discipline. And the tools that he has given to them, as we saw last week, are the rod and rebuke. These tools are always to be used for the good of the child and not for their harm. They are never to be used to vent your frustration or to manipulate, but rather to bring the child to repentance before God. How wonderful it is that God has given us such tools that when joined with his grace will actually have the effect of turning our children back to the Lord when they have ceased to walk with Him. I am sure that you would agree that the sooner you can address your children when they have turned from the way of the Lord, the better. Sin is an enemy. And just as you would not allow an enemy to come into your city and to live among you and to fester and to carry out his his activities to to bring destruction and ruin, you would deal with him and root him out as quickly as possible. So you want to kill sin in its first rising in your children's lives when they have stepped away from the Lord's way. Whining is one of the first outward indications that sin is starting to take over our child or us for that matter. When whining is present, it indicates that we or our children have lost our focus as those who are here for God. Now, I'll develop that more in just a moment. But first, let's go to our scripture reading. Our scripture reading begins in Philippians 1.27 and ends with Philippians 2.17. And we're going to really focus on one verse that I'll present to you in a moment. But it's in this passage and I want to read the context. So give careful attention. This is the word the holy word of God. Again, beginning in Philippians 127. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. So let me just pause here and say, you see, we've been called not only to believe, but also to suffer for His sake. And how we suffer is very important. Do we complain when suffering comes? We're stepping away from God's calling. Or do we honor Him? Now, let's look at the example that's given to us here. Chapter 2, verse 1. Here's the Word of God. Continued. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. And there we end the reading of God's holy word. You see that there were many things about which our Lord Jesus Christ might have complained and about which he might have disputed and said, why would I have to do that? Why should I do that? And so it is with us. We're called not only to believe, but also to suffer. My primary text, of course, is from verse 14, which prohibits whining, to put it in a single word. It says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Complaining is grumbling about what God has done. Disputing is arguing about what God has called you to do. In one word, the prohibition is against whining. The context is important. Paul is calling us as God's covenant people to live in a way that is worthy of our master and the calling that we have before him, our master Jesus Christ. You can see that in the very first verse, 127, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And you can see it toward the end, where in 215, he gives the reason that we should not whine, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. In the middle of it all, Paul presents to us the example of Christ who did not complain or argue, but obeyed God the Father by leaving the glory that was rightfully his as the Son of God. There was nothing, no robbery in claiming to be equal with God. And yet, even as God, he came here as a servant. He reminds us, Paul reminds us of how Christ obeyed all the way to the point of dying on the cross. It was because of this that he was exalted in his human flesh to be Lord and Savior with the name that is above every name. We know, of course, that the Father sent him to the cross to atone for our sins so that we could be pardoned. But Paul's focus in this passage is how he is an example to us of the obedience that we ought to have as God's children. Obedience that is without complaining and without disputing. Whining is completely out of place when we see Jesus and how he went to the cross without any complaining or disputing. How inappropriate it is to have a Savior who is humble and proud sinners who have been redeemed by him, but who whine as if God has wronged them. And that brings us to the first point I would like to develop then after the reading of God's word and the summary of it that we have just had. Whining indicates that I am no longer walking with God. It exposes me as one who has lost my focus as God's child. It shows that I have forgotten his mercy to me. Think about that. Forgotten his mercy. You deserve to be in the pit of hell from the very time of your conception. There is in you resistance and rebellion against the living God who created you. Such wickedness calls for eternal vengeance. And yet, you are not under the eternal vengeance of God. No matter how bad life might be in this world, it doesn't compare with what you deserve and what I deserve, what we all deserve, and what we will receive apart from Christ. How can you complain if you remember God's mercy? He has not withheld, he he has not only withheld that dreadful eternal judgment from you so far for as long as you're in this world but he has also given you many things to enjoy 
in this world. Even the hardest things that you have to face in this world are full of mercies compared to what the place that you deserve would hold. He has also, if you're a believer, secured you for for complete forgiveness, secured to you complete forgiveness through Jesus Christ. He has justified you and he has adopted you as his son, even though you're unworthy of it. He has given you the privilege to live as his child in this world, and he has reserved a place for you in glory through Jesus. How can anyone who remembers such mercy complain about anything that happens to you in this life? There are no grounds for it. My whining shows that I have lost sight of God's mercy. I am not contemplating it. I'm not considering it. I'm not taking it into account. It also shows that I have forgotten what I am here for, that I am here for God. Jesus came to restore us to God as our God, that we might be a people who live for God as our God, that we might be what human beings are supposed to be, those who know that their lives are not for themselves, but for their creator. When I have that focus, I'm ready to live my life for God. I'm willing to pour out my life for his glory. That's what I'm living for. And that's what makes me happy is doing for God's glory. When I am walking with God, my question is not what do I want, but how can I please him? In other words, what I want then is to please him. How can I honor him? That's what I'm living for. I'm living for his glory when I have that right focus, which is all too rare. Whining is my protest against my submission to God and what he has given me or given me to do to either what he has appointed to me or what he has uh, commanded me. It has two parts, as our text shows. I already introduced them to you. Let's look at them more fully. I told you we would. Complaining where I grumble about what God has done. I am displeased with him. Maybe about my health, maybe about my finances, my success in the world, my situation in life, the political situation in the world at large, maybe the traffic or the burned toast to get down to the everyday nitty gritty, the broken phone, my workload, my relationships or my lack of relationships. I'm unhappy. And so I'm full of complaining and murmuring. Instead of accepting these as what God has given me in this fallen world as opportunities for me to honor Him, I complain and grumble. And even if I do not go so far as to curse God directly, that's what I'm actually doing when I complain. I'm like Israel in the wilderness, complaining that I am there, complaining about what I don't have and what I think He should have done for me and didn't do, and disputing is the second part of whining. Disputing is where I argue with God about what he's given me and called me to do, commanded me to do. I don't like his commandments. I don't want to abstain from sexual immorality. I feel that God is unreasonable to ask such a thing of me. Maybe I'm a young adult and I think, well, how could God ask that for, of me? I don't want to tell the truth on my insurance application. The company ought to give me their best rates. I'm entitled to it. I don't want to lay down my life for my wife or submit to my husband. How can God ask me to do something like that? No one does that. I don't want to give a tithe to church. It's not fair. It's not right. I don't make as much as other people. I don't want to keep the Sabbath. I have to work. My ball team plays on Sunday. I want to watch the Super Bowl. I want what I want. I don't want to love my enemies and to do good to them. Why should I love those who have not done good to me? This is what Israel did when they were called to go into the promised land and wipe out the Canaanites. They disputed with God about it. We can't do that. How can you ask us to do that? That's too hard. They lost sight of the fact that they were here for God. So they grumbled and they complained and they argued and they disputed. Think of all the different ways that complaining and disputing can be manifested. Think of all the ways. Envy, self-pity, covetousness, rebellion, discontentment, bitterness, fear, 
anxiety. Fear and anxiety, what is that? It's quarreling with what God might do. You're, you're worried about, well, God might not work this out. He might not make this happen the way I want it to happen. So I'm all anxious about it, or I'm afraid of what's going to happen. Anger. Pride. I deserve better than what I got. See, that's pride. Blindness to God's goodness. Totally don't see His goodness. Ingratitude. Laziness. Don't want to fulfill my calling. I want to just sit around. I don't want to do... I don't want to honor God. Harshness. Malice. Cursing. The list goes on and on and on. Grumbling is the root and and, uh, disputing is at the root of all of those things. As soon as you see whining appear, it shows that you are no longer walking with God. That's where I started out here on the, at this point. But now, having seen what whining is all about, I want to address an important question. This is a parenting that we're talking about here. Does this prohibition against whining apply to children as well as to adults? The answer is yes. It applies to everyone. If a person is capable of whining... That person is responsible for whining and in need of correction whenever they do. It doesn't take a high level of experience or intelligence to whine. Whenever it's done, it's a complaint and a quarrel against God. The one who is old enough to do it is old enough to be corrected for it. And you don't have to be very old to do it. Somehow parents often seem to suppose that when their little kids whine, they can't help it because they're just children. But the truth is, and you ought to know this, it has nothing to do with being a child or an adult. It has everything to do with a rebellious heart against God. Parents, in love to God and to your children, you are to correct your children when they whine. Even the smallest child has a conscience. They know that many of their cries are angry, rebellious cries before they even know what the words angry and rebellious mean. They know that they are unhappy with their God and what He has given them in life before they even know that He is called God. They know that they are not right with their Maker when they whine. It is not helpful to respond to a child's demands. Instead of feeding them whenever they demand it, you as a parent set the time when they need to eat. And if they are whining when it's time to eat, wait till they settle down. Feed them then. When this is done... Children will be much happier. They will sleep better. And so will their parents. And with travel, little children can be taught at a very young age to be cheerful rather than demanding and demanding that they be let out of their car seats or whatever. They need to learn that they are not on earth to make demands and call the shots by whining and complaining and to control everyone. The smaller they are, the easier it is to correct them. As I mentioned last week, it is much easier to straighten out a little sapling than than a young tree that has started to grow rigid. And straightening out the young tree that started to grow rigid is much easier than straightening out an oak tree that has become a giant tree trunk. People are not trees, of course, and God can straighten out old people too. But He has called us to train up our children in the way that they should go and told us that if we do when they're old, they will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. And He has told us, all, to, to, all of us, to discipline ourselves to godliness. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Covenant parents are to do that for themselves as well as for their children. I find one of the hardest things to get across to parents is this need to address whining in their children when they are little. It makes so much difference when it's done then. You have much less correcting to do if you do it early on. You have most of it done when they are so young that they won't even remember being corrected when they are older. But the effect of it will stay with them for the rest of their life, right into old age. Remember the goal. Now, this, of course, is all by God's grace. Remember the goal is to restore them to God when they have stopped walking with Him. When your children whine, they have stepped out of fellowship with God and need to be corrected, reminded, and restored to their calling to serve Him. They will grow worse and worse if you leave them in their rebellion. Remember what I said, you don't leave the enemy there. 
They will grow more and more distant to God and will become more and more alienated from Him. They will become hardened in their rebellion. And you'll have a whole lot more work to do. So having shown you that this commandment to do all things without complaining and disputing applies to all of us, to us and our children. Now, I want to show you that the prohibition against whining applies to all situations. It doesn't say do some things without complaining and disputing. It says to do all things without that. God's standard does not change just because you have something hard to do. Our society is so weak in this regard today. We're one of the weakest societies that has ever been. We're one of the most indulged societies. And we're so weak that we can't handle even the slightest little difficulty. God doesn't say, do all things without grumbling and arguing unless it is something really hard. Then you're at liberty to complain all you want. He doesn't say that. (laughs) Too often we give this liberty to ourselves and to our children, but God has not given us this liberty. Certainly it was hard for the Israelites. Think of it. What would we be like? We would be way worse than they were to go into the wilderness with their families and their little children. And and they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. But God was angry with them for their complaining in that situation. He didn't say, oh, well, it was so hard. I understand why you complain. Certainly it was hard for them to be called to go in and drive out the Canaanites from the land When they had no army and when the Canaanites had fortified cities and trained horses and big people and chariots and things. But uh, but God was very angry with Israel for disputing with him about his call to them to do that. Of course, we're not to give our children more than they can bear. But our tendency in our overindulged age is to give them far less than they can bear and to indulge them when they whine about what we have given them to do and no longer hold them to it. The whining is never, ever acceptable. They can appeal to us respectfully, but whining should never be tolerated. By appealing, I mean they can say, Mommy, may I wait to clean my room until tomorrow? We were getting ready to go outside and play. May I wait and do that tomorrow? But if mom says, No, the child must do it without complaining and disputing. And if they complain and dispute when asked to do it, rather than appealing in a gracious way, they should be disciplined for whining and complaining. God's standard about whining does not change just because we're asked to do something difficult. Keep in mind as well that God's standard does not change because of challenging circumstances. It's related, of course, to it being hard. But parents often make excuses for their children's whining, and there is no excuse ever for whining. Here are a few examples. Tiredness. Tiredness does not make whining acceptable. We are to do all things without grumbling and complaining when we're tired just the same as whether we're not tired. They might ask to be excused from a duty because of tiredness, like I mentioned before, but whining is not asking. Neither is arguing asking. Disappointment. Disappointment does not make whining acceptable. We are to do all things without complaining and arguing, even if we lost the game. Even though we didn't get to go to the party that we wanted to go to or didn't get to have a snack when we wanted to have it. There's no change. Disappointment does not excuse whining. Sickness. Sickness does not make whining acceptable. God doesn't say do all things without complaining and arguing unless you are sick. His standard for sick people in this regard is the same as for people that are perfectly healthy. Some grown men who are indulged as children whenever they got sick are very hard to deal with as adults whenever they get sick. It was drilled into them from childhood that it's okay to whine when you're sick. The Lord calls you to be patient in all things. Being wronged. Being wronged does not give you liberty to whine and make whining acceptable. Just because someone has done wrong to you does not give you the right to do wrong yourself. No, you're called to be patient and to love your enemies and to bless those who sin against you. A child may need to confront the one who has done them wrong, but he, doesn't, he needs to do it in love, seeking to, to, seeking to the one that sinned to bring the one that sinned to repentance and reconciliation. And if the sinning one 
will not hear, the child may need to bring them to a parent. But whining and complaining is never acceptable when someone does wrong to you. That's not the way to deal with wrong. We need to teach, if we teach our children that when they're little tiny children, it will serve them well all the days of their life. When parents allow children to whine because of any of these reasons, they are doing a great disservice to them. Essentially, you're teaching them that they're to do all things without grumbling and disputing as long as everything is going their way. That is ridiculous. The very time that you are tempted and need the commandment to do all things without grumbling and complaining is precisely when things are not going your way. So if you say, well, because things aren't going your way, it's okay, you're completely undoing the commandment. The time you're tempted to argue is precisely when you're giving something that is hard for you to do for some reason. There would be no reason for God to prohibit complaining and and disputing if the command only applied when things are going your way. We learn obedience through suffering when we have to sacrifice and even suffer to do the will of God. We're told that even Jesus Christ learned obedience through suffering. We learn to love him as our God and to give up our lives for him and to receive his comfort when we do things that are hard to do. It's the pathway to true knowledge of God is through the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, let me qualify something here, though, too. I've already qualified some, but uh, there's a place for appropriate sorrow and mourning. And we're not to confuse complaining with appropriate sorrow and mourning. Lamentations is a godly response to the ruination of God's people on account of their sin. We should lament. Did Jesus not weep over Jerusalem? But he did not whine about it. And of course, we mourn the loss of a loved one. We mourn because we love God. God does not God does not want us to be stones And we love the people that he's made and we want to be with them. And when they're taken away, we sorrow. Not as others who have no hope, but we sorrow. It's always wrong for us to begin to grumble and dispute with God, even when he's taken away someone we love. And it's wrong for children to do this as well. And now in the last place, I want to look at how to deal with whining. Deal with whining by bringing your children to Jesus Christ. Parents, what better service can you render to your children than to train them to go to Christ as soon as they start to whine? As I showed you at the beginning, whining is one of the first indications that we have ceased to walk with Christ. It was the, it was the first rise of sin in the garden that brought about the fall. Not fair, that you're not able to eat of all the tree, all, all the trees in the garden. You see, there was a complaint. There was an argument. And then it led on to eating the forbidden fruit. The serpent got Eve to complain because of that one tree that God said not to eat. Sin begins with complaining and disputing with God about our situation and our calling. Parents, by dealing with whining, you get at sin in your children before it breaks out in fighting, stealing, Lying, rebellion, defiance, cursing, Sabbath breaking, angry outbursts, sulking, pretty much every sin that you can name. One of the best things you can do is to help your child learn to anticipate temptation. For example, if your child is tired because relatives are visiting during the holidays, this may be coming up for some of us, maybe there have been irregular meals and Maybe you're having a gift opening with the family and you know from past experience your children often quarrel at such times, don't they? You can talk to them beforehand. Tell them to rejoice in giving as well as receiving. Thinking of Christ who gave all for us. You can remind them that it's hard when the cousins come over, but that God has promised to help us honor Him. And then pray with them before the temptation arises. And be sure to thank the Lord if he helps them. If they give in to temptation, though, remind them that you prayed and that you need to pray sincerely and that you need to ask him for grace and forgiveness. As you do this, you teach them to prepare themselves for hard situations by looking to the Lord. It's an invaluable lesson 
They're all starving to old. If you see a situation, something's coming up, maybe a hard day at work, a hard week at work. It's time to pray beforehand because you anticipate that it's going to be hard. So prepare your children. This may be a hard day. You're sick today. Let's pray that God will help you, especially today, and give you extra grace that you might be able to honor Him all day. Second, help your children when you sense that they are actually in temptation. They're actually being tempted. Okay, that's a step further than the anticipation is that maybe temptation is going to come. Here, it's already come. Okay, you, you see that. Perhaps you've taught them to wait at the table until the, the blessing is said. And it's taking some time for everyone to get around the table. You see them starting to struggle. Complaining is starting to well up from within. It hasn't erupted yet, but you can see them starting to, starting to struggle. Take them aside for prayer at once and, and, and ad, admonish them. What a great training opportunity that is. Take them aside and ask them if they are indeed having trouble waiting patiently. If they agree that they are, or if they're too young to talk, then say, you're having trouble waiting patiently. Talk to them. Let them give them the words. Then, then re, and then suggest prayer. Lead them in prayer. Remind them of how miserable it is it, it will be for them if they give in to whining. But how good it is if they walk with Jesus. How good it will be. Remind them of how Jesus answers our prayers and helps us. Pray with them and then rejoice with them if the Lord gives them grace. How much good it will do in their lives when they are older and they are tempted to indulge in worry, fear, immorality, gluttony, drunkenness, envy, boasting, self-promotion, exploitation, laziness, bitterness, the list goes on and on. If temptation is there, then and you see and you're under that temptation to those things, get to the Lord right, right away. If they will seek the Lord bef- before the whining gets started, when, 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 just even before the whining comes. But if you miss the opportunity to warn them at the temptation stage and they begin to crumble and complain or to dispute and argue, it calls for discipline. It calls for the rod and rebuke. Now, as I mentioned, that sometimes the rebuke may be sufficient by itself, but really when the complaining is broken out, many times it calls for rod and rebuke. Whining should not be tolerated. Way too many parents never discipline for attitude. For example, if they call their child to come, the child comes, it's good enough. They came. Sometimes it's even when they don't come, still the parent doesn't deal with that. But if they come and they come with a disrespectful, complaining attitude, protesting, that's not acceptable. Yes, your child came, but they didn't come in the right way. They did not honor you and they need corrective discipline. You do them a terrible disservice if you leave them in the state of rebellion. They're not walking with God in that case. You will be dealing with much worse sins like fighting temper tantrums, blatant disobedience of various kinds, What can you expect when they're not walking with the Lord and under his grace? Your goal is to restore them to Jesus Christ. Now, it may seem like whining is a little sin to warrant discipline. But when you consider that it is the mother of so many sins and the beginning of departing from God, you can see that it should never be taken lightly at all. To leave this sin is to leave them alienated from God and from walking with him. Draw the line not where you want, but where God draws it. Since he has told us to do all things without grumbling, disputing, you should insist upon it in your own life and in the life of your children. And of course, when you use the rod and when you rebuke them, you should certainly lead them to Christ for forgiveness. Remind them that though their sin is deserving of eternal punishment, there is forgiveness with God through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who died for us. Let them know that hell is for complainers and for disputers with God. Help them ask him for forgiveness for their whining and lead them to give thanks to Christ for his forgiving mercy and lead them to ask him to help them not to sin like this anymore. Talk to them of how ugly and wrong our sin is. God has been so good to us and there is no place for our complaining. We have forgotten that he is our God. 
who has saved us and who has been so kind to us. We have forgotten how great his mercy is. Remind them of how good it is to walk in fellowship with him and how he will help us to live beautiful lives for him instead of ugly lives. Remind them of what a privilege it is to serve the Lord our God. God's will is not fuzzy or unclear in this matter. Do all things without complaining or disputing. That's not hard to understand. It's very plain. Since this is a parenting series, I have stressed the need to hold our children to God's standard about whining. I trust, however, that if your heart is right with God, you fully recognize that you are also called to do all things without grumbling and disputing. Keep your eyes on the grace and kindness of your Savior. Walk with Him in trusting fellowship of the gospel. And instead of complaining, you will find many causes to give thanks in all things and to bask in His love and mercy. Let's ask Him then to help us and our children. Please stand. Gracious Heavenly Father, this is indeed one of the most important things that we and our children can learn. Father, we look at Israel in the wilderness and we see all of the terrible things that grumbling and quarreling and disputing about what you had given them led to for them in the wilderness. It was terrible, Lord, that led them to all kinds of rebellion, to refusing to do what you had commanded them to do, to envy and and quarreling against Moses and Aaron and trying to overthrow their authority that you had given them. It was just ruin them again and again and again. And Father, it is no different today. This is where sin begins with us. It leads to sinful fear and worry and rebellion and uh, all sorts of other sin. Immorality. It just, the list is endless of all the things that, that begin with a dissatisfaction with what you have given, what you have appointed, or what you have told us to do. Father, I pray that you would deliver us from this sin. And Father, we don't want to just be a stoical people who don't do this because we've, we're so rigid and, and, uh, and, and so uniform in the way we, we do things. We want to be a people who are delivered from complaining because we have been saturated with a love for your grace. We've been saturated with your grace and with your mercy. And because we realize what we have received from your hand, because our hearts are drawn out to you and we want to honor you and serve you. Lord, truly, we deserve to die. We deserve to burn in hell. But you have had mercy on us. You have sent Christ to redeem us. We didn't deserve that. We don't deserve even the, anything that we have in this world. Father, we deserve far worse than any trouble that we've had in this world. Well, Father, we... We, will find it so, we would find it so easy here compared to hell if we were to, to go there and then come here. Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, that we would delight in your grace and that we would put far from us, Lord, this discontentment with what you have done. Father, we are such a soft people today, such a effeminate kind of a society, so easily offended, so easily triggered. Father, at least little thing, Have mercy on us, Lord. Deliver us, Lord. Have compassion on us. Turn us back to you, Lord. We are your people. Our delight is to be in following you, Lord. Help us then, Lord, whether we're called to suffer or whether we're called to have great blessings, to walk with you with joyfulness and gratitude. We ask these things in Jesus' name, our risen Savior. Amen.